All right, guys, welcome back to the final part of our series on uh, this article by David Graeber and David Wengro about uh, the the sort of the the story of history and how it is so often abused to make people think that that you know there is this very linear progression from from primitive tribes to uh, farming civilizations to state cities and states and that all of the the inequality that it, we see in our world today is this necessary side effect of that and so we in the first part we sort of like uh, you know, took a deep look at how that story is presented by the great thinkers who are trying to tell big stories about history. And then the second part, we saw how it's really not true at all, and that actually early societies would, would move back and forth uh, oftentimes between, you know, like really settled, uh, ad more advanced looking societies, and then, you know, uh, more uh, nomadic dispersed uh, societies, and then they would go back and forth between hierarchical systems and, and egalitarian systems, they would go back and forth between all sort, you know, like social values and things like that, and that, that, you know, far from this linear evolutionary progression from primitive to advanced that comes with all this baggage. In fact, we see this, this crazy chaotic oscillation all over the place that teaches us nothing about what must be true. And in fact, teaches us that maybe a lot more than we think might be true, might be possible. So we've come to the conclusion of the article here. Let's get going. Section five, time for a rethink. Modern authors have a tendency to use prehistory as a canvas for working out philosophical problems. Are humans fundamentally good or evil, cooperative or competitive, egalitarian or hierarchical? And as a result, they also tend to write as if for 95% of our species history, human societies were all much the same. But even 40,000 years is a very, very long period of time. It seems inherently likely, and the evidence confirms, that those same pioneering humans who colonized much of the planet also experimented with an enormous variety of social arrangements. As Claude Levi Strauss point often pointed out, early Homo sapiens were not just physically the same as modern humans, they were our intellectual peers as well. In fact, most were probably more conscious of society's potential than people generally are today, switching back and forth between different forms of organization every year. Weird sense. Sorry, guys. Uh, rather than idling in some primordial innocence until the genie of inequality was somehow uncorked, our prehistoric ancestors seem to have successfully opened and shut the bottle on a regular basis, confining inequality to ritual costume dramas, constructing gods and kingdoms as they did their monuments, then cheerfully disassembling them once again. If so, the real question is not what are the origins of social inequality, but having lived so much of our history moving back and forth between different political systems, how did we get so stuck? All this is very far from the notion of prehistoric societies drifting blindly towards the institutional chains that blind bind them. It is also far from the dismal prophecies of Fukuyama, Diamond, Morris, and Scheidel, where any complex form of social organization necessarily means that tiny elites are take charge of key resources and begin to trample everyone else underfoot. Most social science treats these grim prognost prognostications as self-evident truths, but clearly, they are baseless. So we might reasonably ask, what other cherished truths must now be cast on the dust heap of history? Quite a number, actually. Back in the 70s, the brilliant Cambridge archaeologist David Clark predicted that with modern research, almost every aspect of the old edifice of human evolution, the explanations of the development of modern man, domestication, metallurgy, urbanization, and civilization, may in perspective emerge as semantic snares and metaphysical mirages. It appears he was right. I don't care where that came from. I was like, should we look up, you know, get a little more context on that quote? But I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, information is now pouring in from every quarter of the globe based on careful empirical fieldwork, advanced techniques of clim climatic reconstruction, chronometric dating, and scientific analyses of organic remains. 
Researchers are examining ethnographic and historical material in a new light, and almost all of this new research goes against the familiar narrative of world history. Still, the most remarkable discoveries remain confined to the work of specialists, or have to be teased out by reading between the lines of scientific publications. Let us conclude, then, with a few headlines of our own. Just a handful to give a sense of what the new emerging history is starting to look like. The first bombshell on our list concerns the origins and spread of agriculture. There is no longer any support for the view that it marked a major transition in human societies. In those parts of the world where animals and plants were first domesticated, there actually was no discernible switch from Paleolithic forager to Neolithic farmer. The transition from living mainly on wild resources to a life based on food production typically took something in the order of 3,000 years. While agriculture allowed for the possibility of more unequal concentrations of wealth, in most cases this only began to happen millennia after its inception. In the time between, people in areas as far removed as Amazonia and the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East were trying farming on for size play farming, if you like, switching annually between modes of production, much as they switch their social structures back and forth. Moreover, the spread of farming to secondary areas such as Europe, so often described in triumphalist terms as the start of an inevitable decline in hunting and gathering, turns out to have been a highly tenuous process which sometimes failed, leading to demographic collapse for the farmers, not the foragers. So again, the story everyone keeps telling is that like farming was this like magical invention and once it was invented it just like spread like wildfire and outcompeted everything else and and changed the face of the earth. And in fact, uh-uh. In fact, oftentimes farming, you know, didn't take in a certain area and the hunter gatherers were able to outcompete. And oftentimes they just like try farming and be like, "You know what? Nah, not for us. We're going back. We're going the other way." And this just just you know, let me rant for just a second. This is like so often a thing that, that bothers me about the way sort of like we think about the world. You see it so often in like medicine and, and, and science related to like, you know, the human body in the optimal way where people will tell you like, oh, well, you got to eat, you know, uh, like six servings of vegetables a day or whatever. Like, you know, oh, well, this... This, you know, you, you got to make sure you get like a blast of early light in the morning. There are all these, you know, prescriptions that are handed out as like, this is how you optimally run a human body. And they're always based on these studies where like, it's never like, oh, well, 100% of people saw an uptick in whatever once they adopted this behavior. It's always like, oh, well, you know, 70% of people saw a, a, a clinically significant improvement. You know, it's like, well, what about that other 30? You know, was there some confounding thing in their life that made it not work? Or was it maybe just like not right for them? And most doctors and most people will tell you like, no, every human's different. Every body is like this incredibly complicated, crazy, you know, uh, like, uh, orchestra of different instruments playing and like there's no one prescription that is going to be right for everybody so you got to figure out what's right for you and talk to your doctor and all that sort of shit but it's the same thing here right it's like you know uh eating eating a certain diet is not going to be right for everybody and farming is not going to be right for every civilization and we like to tell these simple stories right we like to believe that that the correct way of living is knowable and measurable and can be written down and and learned and then put into practice when in fact, you know, you got to figure out what's right for you and history is this crazy chaos of a thousand different civilizations living in a million different circumstances and there is no right way for society to work. There is no right technology or right social organization or right, you know, uh, uh, like way of uh, generating heat. What was that thing we talked about in part one? There is no, you know, best way. It's just... There's a lot of different options and a lot of different values to try to maximize and a lot of different trade-offs to, to, you know, calculate. And, you know, sometimes some things work and sometimes other things work. So, you, you know, as pretty as the story of, of linear progress and evolution is, it elides over, you know, the, the real complexity at the heart of, of you know, life. 
And people like to think, and again, it comes back to this notion of the, like, the technocratic, neoliberal, you know, like, e expert who's like, ah, oh, well, you know, this is just how we study pre prehistoric civilizations. We can determine that this is the, you know, that, that this is the right way to be and that this is how you make a stable society and this is the trade-offs that come with, with, you know, this and that thing. It's like, nah, there's, you know, the, the possibilities are endless and what we can do is limitless. And there are, there are so many different things we can try and so many different ways of trying them that anyone who comes to you and says like, nah, like this is just how the world works. Sorry, it's gotta be this way is full of shit. And they've swallowed some false simplicity or false dichotomy that like makes them feel good because it makes them feel like they understand and then they get to speak very authoritatively and use, you know, a, t a certain tone of voice that, that gives them, you know, it quells the, the raging anxiety about the unknowable complexity of the universe and, and gives them some sense of, of safety and stability. But it's all bullshit and, you know, they're using that bullshit to, to keep down uh, a, a lot of really inspiring and hopeful and, and helpful messaging in, in support of a status quo that, quo that maybe doesn't deserve their, you know, uh, unearned confidence defense. Sorry, I was uh, just, just set off on a little thing there. Let's uh, finish off this article here. Clearly, it no longer makes any sense to use phrases like the agricultural revolution when dealing with processes of, processes of such inordinate length and complexity. Since there was no Eden-like state from which the farmers could take their first steps on the road to inequality, it makes even less sense to talk about agriculture as marking the origins of rank or private property. If anything, it is among those populations, the Mesolithic peoples, who refused farming through the warming centuries of the early Holocene, that we find stratification becoming more entrenched. At least if opulent burial, predatory warfare, and monumental buildings are anything to go by. In at least some cases, like the Middle East, the first farmers seem to have consciously developed alternative forms of community to go along with their more labor-intensive way of life. These Neolithic societies look strikingly egalitarian when compared to their hunter-gatherer neighbors, with a dramatic increase in the economic and social importance of women, clearly reflected in their art and ritual life. Contrast here the female figurines of Jericho and Katalhoyuk with the hyper-masculine sculpture of Gobekli Tepe. Another bombshell. Civilization does not come as a package. The world's first cities did not just emerge in a handful of locations, together with systems of centralized government and bureaucratic control. In China, for instance, we are now aware that by 2500 BC, settlements of 300 hectares or more existed on the lower reaches of the Yellow River over a thousand years before the foundation of the earliest royal dynasty, the Shang Dynasty. On the other side of the Pacific, at around the same time, ceremonial centers of striking magnitude have been discovered in the valley of Peru's Rio Supe, notably at the site of Corral, enigmatic remains of sunken plazas and monumental platforms four millennia older than the Inca Empire. What's going on there? Ceremonial centers of striking magnitude have been discovered uh, like 4,000 years before the Inca Empire, which is sort of the first like big state starts developing, I guess. Let's, uh, let me just do site of corral and, and see, see what these, these things are he's talking about. Yeah. Okay. So we've got, yeah, yeah, these sort of, you know, China. Oh damn. That looks, uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. So they've got this like city looking thing 4,000 years before the Inca start, you know, having like a, what we would call a, a civilization. Such recent discoveries indicate how little is yet truly known about the distribution and origin of the first cities, and just how much older these cities may be than the systems of authoritarian government and literate administration that were once assumed necessary for their foundation. And in the more established heartlands of urbanization, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, the Basin of Mexico, there is mounting evidence that the first cities were organized on self-consciously egalitarian lines, municipal councils retaining significant autonomy from central government. In the first two cases, uh, that would be Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley, cities with sophisticated civic infrastructure flourished for over half a millennium with no trace of royal burials or monuments, no standing armies or other means of large-scale coercion, nor any hint of direct bureaucratic control over most citizens' lives. So again, you know, 
the, the, the part of the story that, that is being told is that, like, look, if you want these massive, you know, cities, if you want these big societies with thousands, millions of people, you're going to have to have the inequality that comes along with the administration of those cities. And what he's saying here is like, nah, when we look at these cities, we don't see it's like, oh, well, as soon as they became cities, you know, they had to adopt these really, you know, like a hierarchical authoritarian systems and had to get rid of their old hunter-gatherer egalitarian. It's like, no, for, for 500 years, cities would be, you know, relatively, uh, uh, like, unhierarchical or relatively, you know, uh, egalitarian. Um, that, that was redundant. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, yeah, again, this, this story that we are told of how things must be and the order that must exist does not pass historical muster. Jared Diamond notwithstanding, there is absolutely no evidence that top-down structures of rule are the necessary consequence of large-scale organization. Walter Scheidel notwithstanding, it is simply not true that ruling classes, once established, cannot be gotten rid of except by general catastrophe. To take just one well-documented example, around 200 AD, the city of Teotihuacan in the Valley of Mexico, with a population of 120,000, one of the largest in the world at the time, appears to have undergone a profound transformation, turning its back on pyramid temples and human sacrifice and reconstructing itself as a vast collection of comfortable vias, all almost exactly the same size. It remained so for perhaps 400 years. Even in Cortez's day, Central Mexico was still home to cities like Tlaxcala, 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 I don't know, man. Cities like this one, run by an elected council whose members were periodically whipped by their constituents. An elected council whose members were periodically whipped by their constituents to remind them who was ultimately in charge. So yeah, 200 AD, Teotihuacan goes from being this like massive city with, you know, these pyramid temples and human sacrifice and instead becomes this like, you know, really equal, you know, town with a bunch of little vill villas uh, dotting around it. And then you got these guys where you got a city where the, the elected council, I mean, this feels, to be honest, this feels more like, you know, just sort of some kind of ritual. Like, I could honestly see that being a thing where it's like, okay, you're, you're like a god king, but like, uh, you know, once a year there's this ritual where the people get to whip you. I don't know, this doesn't seem like it d definitively proves that it was an egalitarian society, but that is a cute, cute little historical anecdote for sure. The pieces are all there to create an entirely different world history. For the most part, we're just too blinded by our prejudices to see the implications. For instance, almost everyone nowadays insists that participatory democracy, or social equality, can work in a small community or activist group, but cannot possibly scale up to anything like a city, a region, or a nation state. But the evidence before our eyes, if we choose to look at it, suggests the opposite. Egalitarian cities, even regional confederacies, are historically quite commonplace. Egalitarian families and households are not. So again, this is a point we were talking about earlier, right? Where, where we assume that, you know, it's in, in like, fa oh, okay, well, you know, maybe socialism works with like your family. Maybe you'll like be willing to, to share for, you know, your little group of people you know, but it couldn't possibly scale up to society. There's no way people would, you know, make sacrifices for someone they don't know across the country. And what he's saying is that, like, actually, uh, what we see in, in the evidence is that, you know, in little family scale groups, not really the case. It tends to be very authoritarian and very, like, you know, dominance uh, based. Where it's like a, a patriarch who, who runs things. But there's lots, there's, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 think it's, I don't think he's trying to say, I think he maybe overreaches based on what he's presented here, at least, with saying that, like, you know, uh, that, that egalitarian cities are historically quite commonplace, egalitarian families and households are not. I mean, he's the one who's looked at more of the evidence, or they're the ones who have looked at more of the evidence. So if they're saying egalitarian cities are commonplace and family egalitarian families and households are not, I guess I'll believe them. But it seems like what they were saying was more that, like, there is no rule that says that families can be egalitarian and cities can't. You know, that was more the impression I got from the article. But, I don't know, they're saying egalitarian cities are historically quite commonplace, egalitarian families and households are not. 
Once the historical verdict is in, we will see that the most painful loss of human freedoms began at the small scale, the level of gender relations, age groups, and domestic servitude, the kind of relationships that contain at once the greatest intimacy and the deepest forms of structural violence. If we really want to understand how it first became acceptable for some to turn wealth into power and for others to end up being told their needs and lives don't count, it is here that we should look. Here, too, we predict, is where the most difficult work of creating a free society will have to take place. So I feel like I kind of blew my wad on, on doing a big ranty thing with that rant I did a little bit earlier. Probably should have held that till the end to get all high and mighty about how there's no, like, you know, one prescription for how to live a good life or how to form a good society and that there's all kinds of different problems that require all kinds of different solutions and, you know, that, that you got to just understand that, that there are all sorts of options, but, you know. Yeah, that. Go go rewind like 10 minutes and watch that rant again and pretend I, I held off on it till now and it can be like the, you know, stirring, rising conclusion of this video. But yeah, I, I just think this is such a fascinating article. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that David Graeber wrote this book called Debt, uh, The First 5,000 Years, which is one of the most amazing books I've ever read and absolutely highly recommend it. And one of the things he does in there is is question the sort of myth of barter. You know, every every class, you know, Econ 101 or like World History 101 will teach you that like first we, you know, we, we had this problem where you could trade, you know, your chickens for someone else's cows, but what if they don't want chickens? What if they want boots? So you have to go trade your chickens for boots and then you can trade a boot for a cow. And like what he says is like, nah, there's actually no, oh, so then we invent money so that you can, you know, uh, trade your chickens for money and then trade your money for cows. You don't have to go find someone who has boots and wants chickens. And what he says is that like basically that never happened. That was not the way money developed anywhere and that it was basically a tool kings used to, to organize armies and that, you know, uh, it, it, yada, yada, yada. It's a great book. You should go read it. But uh, uh, Graeber and, and I'll give Wengro credit for this article too. I, I know I keep saying he because in my head it's a David Graeber article, but it's not. It's in collaboration with someone else. But they, they do a great job of taking, you know, the law of gravity, you know, the, the, the sort of things that you think are just like these ironclad facts that you have to reason around and that cannot be questioned. They are the ground on which we, you know, build. Uh, and, and we don't, you know, they show us that, that the ground can be dug up, that, that that is not a law, that it is not gravity. It is just a, a narrative that has been constructed out of a, a, a very incomplete fact set. And, you know, open your mind to thinking that, okay, so maybe these things that I just assumed had to be true, maybe they're not. Maybe there are other ways of, of living and of organizing societies. And maybe, you know, we're not at the, at the tip of some wonderful but flawed evolution and that you know we just have to accept all of all of these problems because that's just hey you know if you want running water you got to accept you know uh, mass poverty and 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 obscene wealth living next door to each other like no like maybe there are better systems that are possible and maybe we are not just sort of spiraling off in one direction or another but we are in fact forging our way you know to a better society I had this thought the other day, I, I, I talked about the Martin Luther King line earlier that the moral arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And I had this thought the other day, to be honest, I can't remember if I had it originally or if I like read someone else talking about it, but that, you know, okay, fine, the moral arc of history bends towards justice, eh, debatable when you look at history, you know, if, if things do just like keep getting more and more justice. I think, I think the more accurate thing is that the moral arc of history can be bent you know it is not some some cosmic thing some god-given thing that just like is how it is and we have no role but to traverse it you know we bend the moral arc of history we shape it into the thing that we want it to be and so long as we swallow these stories that it has to go in one direction and that only one direction is you know possible for justice we limit our ability to shape it into the justice that we actually want we accept that 
for our, our running water and our, you know, Uber Eats and, and all that sort of shit, we have to put up with, you know, all of the various social problems that we see in the world today. And I think once we understand how crazy history really is and how, you know, free we really are to experiment with different models, we get a lot more ability to bend that arc towards justice. So that is what this article says to me is, is anything is possible and better things certainly are. So I hope it was similarly inspiring to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to publish the first three all at once just because I want to drop a whole fuck ton of content. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to record the third uh, article, which is Matt Stoller talking about how Democrats sold out their populist soul uh, in the wake of Watergate and ushered in, you know, a, 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 a lot of very similar theme, things to what we talked about in this one. So I'm going to record that tomorrow and then I'm probably going to drop all of these all at once, a whole bunch of videos. And then I'll probably keep recording one a day, but just release one part a day from there on so we can get, you know, a, a nice backlog of, of content going up and uh, then I can start doing, you know, the, the actual proper dailies news show and have some, you know, some of these in the tank to keep pushing out. So that's what's coming up. Hope it's, uh, you know, good for you guys or some shit. I don't know. I'm gonna head on out of here. Have a good one, y'all. Take it easy. Goodbye.